And you're live on Facebook. Awesome. We're actually seriously live on Facebook now. This is awesome. I, I don't see it. I still see where it says Lindsay Ginsburg. All right, fantastic. Well, I can't see all the numbers popping up, but I'm sure that they're popping up by now because we have the one and the only Scott Chesney with us. For, so, for those of you guys that don't know Scott yet, he's an absolutely incredible individual that's achieved just absolutely remarkable things throughout his life. And uh, if you have not yet been to his website, I'm just going to pre-frame his talk with this because, you know, sometimes I think he's a very humble person and he doesn't really give himself the credit that he deserves. If you have not yet been to his website, scottchesney.com, go there today. And I'm sure on there you could find instructions to see his, the documentary highlighting his life. It's called Ride the Wave. I'm not going to give it away. I'm just going to tell you that it's absolutely amazing. I watched it with my family at the beginning of the quarantine and it was incredibly motivational. And it was one of those things that I just so happy that I got to share that film with my family. So uh, once again, Scott, thanks for being here. You're a true friend to myself and the entire Max Challenge family. Just always there for us, uh, encouraging, inspiring and leading the way. So. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Brian. And you know, the, the feeling's mutual with the way I feel about you and uh, feel about the community because uh, support systems are so important, especially during challenging times. And the Max Challenge ha has been there. So uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of the group and, and following all the inspiration. Um, I have to tell you, it just felt so good. I, I think it was, uh, was it Rich and the crew who were outside doing their uh, routine outside in a parking lot and everything. So I know that in this world right now, Brian, we, we are all mastering uh, the art. And I, I don't mean like learning, we're mastering the art of the pivot. And uh, I know you are, and I know so many of uh, people who are part of the Max Challenge family are doing so. And while it's tough, and I always tell people it's something tough, then it's gonna require a little bit more work, a little bit more effort, a little bit more patience. Uh, if it's impossible, it's just going to take a little bit longer, but uh, we're actually emerging and I'm seeing it for all the challenges that are in this world right now. We are getting stronger through these tests um, and they are major tests, maybe unlike we've ever seen before, but we are, and I say that collectively, but I want every person examining his or her life who's on this call and giving yourself credit because you're getting stronger. I don't know if it's your heart. I don't know if it's your resilience. I don't know if it's your creativity, but we are getting stronger. That's crazy. I, it, but when you put it in perspective like that, because you know we thought we were being tested, Scott, right? Uh, what, what, what is this like going on day 100? I think it was yesterday, right? I don't know. I, I mean, think that's the way I'm thinking about it, Brian, is that like when this all started, like you're going in the opposite direction. You had a full head of hair. And, and <laughs> I said, I don't know what's going on with you, but I know. I mean, most people are wearing hats because they're covering up hair. He's just wearing hats because he's like embarrassed to be bald now. I, I don't get it, but you know what? I love you. And uh, we do whatever we can. But yeah, we're, we're pivoting, we're modifying, and um, we're, we're doing- Like you said though, like we thought we were being tested a hundred freaking days ago. And now we're being tested much greater than we ever could have imagined, I think. And yeah, but we, we want control. That's what we want. Even like, yeah, you're right. We were tested day one. And then we were saying, okay, it might last a few weeks. It might last a few months. Is that, I, I, I don't know if there's somebody up there who's pushing the buttons or who's controlling this whole dance down here. But the moment where we look to gain control over something is where another possible obstacle, I like to say a lesson or a message that is thrown our way. For whatever reason, we are not done with this thing yet. And knowing full well, again, I wish I could go back months ago and make like this never happened. But in any type of adversity, there are blessings in disguise. And when something lasts a little bit longer, I can only speak for myself. We all got to examine our own lives. But what more? Even through that frustration, even through that lack of patience we might have, is that, okay, how can I improve my life? How can I elevate my life? How can I go even a little bit deeper right now in my resilience, in my courage, and emerge from this even stronger? Um, again, it doesn't take away, please understand everybody out there, it doesn't take away from the frustration, the sadness, the anger, everything else that we experience during adversity. 
but there's not one person in any type of adversity, whether it be what's going on now or anything that's gone in your life in which there isn't a message, there isn't a lesson that you can extract from it that has helped you become better, a better version of yourself today. You know, I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm supposing that you're sitting in your home office or something or? I'm sure not standing. What do you mean you're sitting? <laughs> um, yeah, this is my home office, yeah. The reason why I ask is because I see the picture of Nelson, every time we talk, I see the picture of Nelson Mandela behind you. And I, you know, look, like we hop on here. What's the first thing I see? I see that picture. And it immediately reminds me of his story and how, uh, you know, in spite of being imprisoned, he kept his ideals front of mind and kept marching forward. And eventually he was freed and then became the president of the, you know the history better than me, but he became the president of the country that enslaved him. And without bitterness, without that bitterness that most people would, you know, go after the people that um, in, that that basically imprisoned him rather than, than you know, um, joining forces and trying to make the country, I, I guess, better for all. Well, for me, th this is my poster child for resilience right here. One of my greatest heroes. And this has been on the wall in my office for, I want to say, 15 years now. And I had a chance along with my wife back in 2000 to actually travel to South Africa, to go to Cape Town, to go to uh, Robben Island, where the prison was, and actually take a tour. What's interesting is that the gentleman who gave us a tour back in 2000 had been in prison at the same time Nelson Mandela was for a few of those years. And so he said, um, Scott, do you know that day that he was released from prison, there was a big press conference. And I said, I wasn't aware of that. He said the first question that was asked from him by a member of the media was, Mr. Mandela, how did you ever survive 27 years in prison? With a little grin to his face, he said, I wasn't surviving, I was preparing. And I still, I say that to you, I get goosebumps, but when I first heard it, I had the biggest goosebumps. But it's also, and again, it, it's no coincidence we're talking about this right now, is that we can extract stories of either our own examples in our lives, family members, people we know well, or people who we don't even know, who withstood the test of time and said, I don't care what the conditions are out there. I can only control myself. And what I like to say with him, the power of belief in wanting to have a free South Africa, to one bring all people together, different races, different creeds, create equality, even in his confinement, he found a way to really, really spread a movement to the point where I, I love describing it. It's almost like he took a stone and throwing it into a still pond. He made a splash before he went into prison with all the things he did. And don't get me wrong, he broke the law. He did break the law. He deserved to be in prison, probably not that long, but he broke the law. But what's interesting is that, so he created the splash, but then there was a ripple effect that affected everyone, not just in Cape Town, South Africa, but around the world. And so it's, it's a reminder of so many ways that yes, one person can make a difference, but also to say, you know what, no matter how confining our environment is around us, no matter how grim things may look, man, you can't take away this heart. You can't take away my spirit. You can't take away my power of belief. And when he got out of prison, like a shoot, I don't know how much longer it was. Yeah, he became president of South Africa. Unbelievable. So, like he, he went through pain. He struggled. He was blinded because he used to chip away at this rock that was there and the sun glaring off of it. I mean, he had like irreparable damage done to his eyes and he still carried on. And so, again, I know we don't have conditions necessarily out there like Nelson Mandela, but absolutely. I love that he sits behind me every day when I'm at my home office because I am deriving so much strength from his story and all the other stories that are going on in the world today. Folks, there, there are massive amounts of challenges, and um, it is a challenging, difficult time. But I'm also under the belief, Brian, is that these issues are emerging. They are surfacing to help us do things collectively as the world that maybe we should be doing better. But all signs are pointing for us to go within. Our belief systems are being challenges. Our, our, our ways of thinking about money, 
what we think of as security, every single issue, not for everyone, but you think of those ones that are pushing your buttons more than anything, that may be driving you crazy. You can either continue let them drive you crazy, or you can go deeper within yourself and to say it's because they're rising to the surface that, you know what, I have what it takes to begin to address these. And I don't think had some of these challenges, pandemic and everything else that's going on, had not happened, these issues, we would have found a way to distract ourselves and push them down. And please, I wanna be clear, especially for those people that just jumped on this, is that I am not saying I go out there looking for adversity. I don't want you to say, ooh, let's fail because there's feedback from failure. No, all I know is when it happens, I feel my feelings, my frustrations, and then I get around to, okay, the search and discovery. What's the message? What's the lesson? What's going to help me? Because I only have control over myself. Evolve at a greater rate and at a more expansive level. That's where I'm at right now. That's awesome. You know, that, that picture of uh, old woman, but if you look at it in a certain way, it's a young woman. You know, that's all that, right? Like perspective, it's perspective. Perspective, right. Do you think everybody has the ability to look at things with the perspective of optimism and positivity? And, you know, what could somebody do if they find themselves entrapped, you know, seemingly entrapped in this state of mind where they don't see that picture of the young woman, they only see the old woman who's at the end of her life and everything is you know, she's had a horrible life. She's all beaten up in this picture, right? She's not in, in, in good shape. You know, what could people do to help nurture the, the ability to see the positive in a situation? Absolutely. It, Brian, we have the opportunity to be the most optimistic people in the world. We also have the opportunity to be the most pessimistic person in the world. And so what I like to say is that it's almost like we're driving a car right now. And I really want to put it simple for people is that when you're driving the car, okay, is that you have um, side view mirrors and you have a rear view mirror. And so what I like to think of this and think of it in terms of life too, is that we want to reflect on the past. We want to take a look on it at, at what's going on. We want to learn from it. We want to know, okay, how is it coming up and affecting us now? That's what we do when we're driving. Now, if we spend too much time on those side view mirrors or that rear view mirror, we're going to hit the car in front of us. This is where I say, okay, reflect on the past. But if you're dwelling on something, and usually we're dwelling on something that's not making us too happy, is that we are focused. This is where we are choosing to allow our minds to play our past over and over again to the point where it's like a broken record. And also when you're driving, sometimes it might be that exit up there. Ooh, this is where I got to turn or this is a service station. I need more gas or I want to get a bite to eat. You have an eye on the future too. And you want to begin preparing and planning and so forth. But if you spend too much time looking ahead while you're driving, you're going to hit that car in front of you as well. So what I like to think is that with the future, with regards to our lives, when you feel anxiety building up, when you're becoming too anxious, when you're getting too nervous, that's when it's not necessarily you're in the past anymore, is that you're too preoccupied with the future and you're getting caught up in that. And while I like to plan and prepare, you have no control over that. So it's okay. I need to, and it's as simple as this, Brian. It's taking a deep breath and it's coming back to the moment. You now, you might say, well, I don't know how to come back to the moment. The best way that I know how to come back to the moment is I flood my life now. Tidal waves of gratitude and things that I have. Ladies and gentlemen, I want, want everything. Want this to be gone. Want business to resume. Want your children to be able to do what they were doing. Want it all. But please, please make something just a little bit stronger each and every day and what it is that you have. Even during these challenging situations, what do I have in my life right here, right now? Why is it, even with all this stuff that's happening outside, why is it still not a good, but a great time to be alive for me? And I'm letting you know is that when you do that and you learn, even during the most challenging situations, how to bring yourself back to the moment, is that that will be self-awareness. And that will help you to understand a little bit more. And then less judgment other people, less judgment other circumstances, 
because you will know. It's almost like, and I've used this analogy before, is that um, with the hurricane. So if anyone's ever experienced a hurricane before and like a, a lot of wind, a lot of rain, I lived down in Miami, I went through one of them and, and there's a lot, but inside every hurricane, there is an eye of the storm. And that eye of the storm, there's peaceful. You go to an eye of the storm in a hurricane, there is a peacefulness. You're almost wondering, is there really a storm going on? Yeah, there's turbulence going on around you. That's our lives. So again, we have to sometimes engage in that turbulence and get caught up in it. But within ourselves, and I don't know if this is meditation, deep breathing, um, uh, relaxation techniques, stress management techniques, is that you come home to yourself and you find that eye of the storm, get some more energy, get some more clarity and focus to the point where now I can re-engage. And maybe it's visiting something in the past, or maybe it's really uh, ramping up and getting ready for something in the future. But you will know where that place is within you that allows you to find the peace and tranquility, even if it's just a few moments that will help you to better manage what's going on outside of us. That's awesome. Fantastic advice. So it reminds me of uh, a member the other day posted something that it, it's the same story that, you know, with the rear view mirror. But, you know, what she said was, if you take that rear view mirror and you made it the size of your front rear windshield, you'd block <laughs> your, right? You'd obviously, you couldn't drive the car, right? right? And this is, I, I think it was a really great uh, way to put it in perspective because it's true. If you're just staring at it and that's all that's available to you, man, are you going to, you're going to crash in a matter of seconds. And I think it's the same thing in our lives. We're going to crash if we just keep looking in the rear view and aren't trying our best to, to focus on the, on the future ahead. Right. And Brian, is that our pasts are up here, the, the memories. This is when um, the mind is leading the way. And I've talked about this with people is that when your mind is leading the way, it's about fear, disbelief, playing small in life. This is what, what the mind loves to do. It loves to do this with the past. It loves to get you caught so worked up about the future and everything because it, it doesn't like change. And so that's why this, there's no coincidence that our heart is in the middle of our bodies. This just wants to be in the moment. This just wants to move forward. This just wants to like accept people. This just wants to unite. This wants to connect. This is just where the resiliency comes in and the courage to move forward comes in. And it's not just there. It is during times of adversity. And when we say, okay, there's no other choice, I go within. But there's also a wonderful challenge now that's being presented to us in which we can choose to live here. And then when this is leading the way, the courage, the expansion, the subscribing to the belief that anything is possible, then this beautiful thing called your mind comes along for the ride and serves you in the form of creativity and imagination. And then when then these two are in sync and working together, that's when there's just, it's beautiful. And getting back to wonderful water analogies, that's when you kind of like, just feel like you're in the zone, things are flowing beautifully. But Brian, it, it, it's not easy. And one of the things I wanted to mention, because I, I just don't want people to, out there to think like, oh, things are all just like fine and dandy for Scott. Before we got on the air is that I was talking to Brian and also Lindsay, and thank you, Lindsay, for coordinating all this, is that, um, <laughs> And I'm thinking back on yesterday. I, I, I've been doing a lot of graduations for, for kids and everything and coming in and being their speaker. And yesterday, one of the kids had asked me, Mr. Chesney, what was your greatest challenge? What's the greatest challenge been in your life? Some people might think paralysis for 35 years. Some people might think breaking my leg almost three years ago when I was surfing. Some people might think of this pandemic right now. No, it's actually what we were discussing before I come on there. So um, I popped my shoulder. I had a shoulder injury almost two weeks ago. So everything I do is with my hands, with my arms, with my shoulders. They're like my legs. And all of a sudden I did a transfer, just getting from my bed into my wheelchair, something that I have done thousands of times, something how I got to get along and move on with my life. I did this basic transfer and I felt something pop in my shoulder, followed by excruciating pain. And every time I went to move my arm and do things, I experienced a lot of pain. Now I have a lot of friends out there. My thoughts and prayers go out to them who've been using wheelchairs fewer years than I have or longer years who have had multiple surgeries on their shoulders. I mean, your shoulders aren't meant for the wear and tear that living life from a wheelchair have. People who don't even use a wheelchair experience shoulder issues and sometimes 
and it becomes very debilitating, especially to have surgery sometimes. And I'm not ruling out all surgeries, but I just, I got a picture of that road and all of a sudden I was like, this, this is awful. This is like, you take away my arms, you take away my shoulders, you take away my hands. And so what I did, and I want people to understand that you can do this with any type of fear because I got scared. It scared me. And I'm probably still in a little place of fear, but right away I said, okay, Scott, what do you do with fear? And so I leverage fear. And so right away I said, okay, what's the worst case scenario here? And I entertained it. So if you're looking to move forward and make changes, please, I'm talking about my example, but I want you to plug in whatever fear is there right now, is that I said, worst case scenario, I have to get surgery. I'm going to be laid up for uh, probably about two months, and then it's probably going to take up to a year to fully heal. I let that in. I entertained it. Oh, hell no. Am I going to dwell on it? I entertained it because I don't want it eating away at me. Then I went to the best case scenario. What's the best case scenario? I need rest and I'm gonna need rehabilitation. I'm gonna need to go to physical therapy. Best case scenario. Then I say, what's the most likely case scenario? That's where there's a level of uncertainty. But I said, probably, and I was trusting my gut instincts, maybe prolonged PT, a lot of rest, maybe different treatments and so forth, but not necessarily surgery. Um, I put my focus you want to know what I dwell on? I dwell on the best case scenario. I put as much energy and focus, prayers, energy, and I even post things about it because it's not to say, oh, this is what I'm going through. No, I believe in the power of positive thinking. I believe in the power of prayer. I got people all around the world doing Reiki on me, doing healing energy, sending prayers. And I know on some level that that has gotten to my shoulder to the point where I am so happy to say that Rest and PT um, is what my near future looks like. And so like everything came to the surface, folks. And, and you can plug this in to anything. Ask, I always say, ask the question. Ask the question of yourself. Ask it of someone else. Answer it. Get the answer. If you don't have the answer within you, find an answer from someone else. And then if you feel in your heart that it's the right answer, act on it. Act on it and move forward. And so that's what I'm doing with, I will say, and not just to say, hey, you know what, we're, we're doing this live interview now, but this was probably one of the scariest and most challenging two weeks I have experienced. And I have no problem saying that. And yes, it's filled with pain, but as I've shared with all of you before, is that <laughs> pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. And I don't mean anyone out there, we're experiencing pain right now, physical, emotional, mental pain, you got it. But we grow from pain. It hurts in the moment. Oh, does it hurt? But we learn from that pain. The suffering, and I'm not here to judge anyone, that's a choice. If anybody wants to get in contact with me, and I, I have a choice, I can give you people around the world right now who you would say have every single reason to suffer who are choosing not to suffer. So I try not to play that card um, at all. Um, I just felt like sharing it. <laughs> You did say you did, it's very helpful, incredibly helpful for people, for me to hear for sure. And I, I, I'm guessing for others, it, it's, you know, but, um, um, you know, you, 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 you try not to suffer, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, cause I, I think a lot of people beat themselves up, right? Like, why do I have these negative thoughts? Why am I, you know, if I can only do what, uh, what Scott Chesney could do or what Nelson Mandela could do or what, and control my mind. But it's not that easy. It's right. I wouldn't think. It. But it, no, no. So it's not. So I want to, and I'm so glad you brought this up because um, I've been coaching a lot of people on this recently. It's not about controlling your mind. So it, the moment we look to control something is that all of a sudden we don't allow it to breathe too much. Okay. So I want you to think about um, a planting a seed. So we plant a seed. We want to have a plant to grow is that we prepare the soil, we put the seed in there, we cover it, we put fertilizer in there, maybe it gets sunlight and we'll water it from time to time. Control over that process would be digging that up every day. Hey, little seed, you growing? Are you growing underneath there? No, if you do that, you're going to kill it. So if you say, okay, so then what do you do then? Is that you plant the seed and you take all the necessary precautionary measures or measures that you need to do and then there is a part, and this is a phrase that is still kind of etheric to many of us, 
is that you've got to let go and trust the process. You have to let go and trust the process because if you are there and in a place of trying to control and dictate every single move, I am telling you one is that you are absolutely trapped up in here. You're probably replaying your motives and you're replaying your actions that you did for things in the past. And there's got to be a time like, I'm going to let this play out. I'm going to see how this grows. I've taken precautionary measures. If I need to intervene, fine. But I absolutely believe, Brian, when we are so wrapped up and everybody, anyone who's out there in, in terms of your, your mind, don't, don't fight your mind. So the technique I wanted to share real quick is that, okay, my mind's racing. My, my mind is telling me this, whether it be negative thoughts or just racing and scattered all over the place. First of all, I do believe in meditation. But a simple little technique that has been working wonders for myself and other people is I want you to picture when your mind is racing, it's a movie. And more than likely, it's a drama, probably an award-winning drama. I want you to picture it up on your imaginary screen and just kind of like sit back as the observer to it, knowing full well you can insert yourself as the character anytime you want. And you watch it play out. And more than likely, that same drama is going to be played out in similar ways throughout the course of a day, throughout the course of weeks. And what will happen through more self-awareness and choosing to do this, taking a few deep breaths, is that you will start to laugh at this because you will realize, I know what scene's coming up next. I know what you're going to say next, mine. And I know how this tape plays out. And I know how I used to act as a result of you telling me, no. I refuse to insert my character to this drama anymore. And you start to gain a little bit more management. I don't want to say control, because when you start to try to control your mind, it's going to want to fight you. Give it a platform. Let it play out. Let it run amok. Just don't insert yourself as the character anymore. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. Because, you know, I, like a friend of mine said the other day, he goes, you know, People look at you because somehow you got, you know, to X number of locations and so many members and X number of franchisees or whatever. They look like you have no problems, like your life is perfect and this and that. And, you know, it's like almost laughable. And, and because everybody has problems, I, I think what served me at some point is recognizing that life is a whole bunch of obstacles. Yeah, I don't like to call them problems, but like obstacles or challenges that help us to grow and become better. And they're just lined up in a row. And it's like, so that way by accepting it, it's like, okay, here it is. And here's that feeling again, by the way, I think that's kind of what you said. Here's that feeling again. And that's okay. I know who you are, but I mean, we're not gonna let it go too far, right? We're going to kind of like, just accept that it's there, but I'm going to keep moving ahead over here. I'm going to keep showing up to work and keep doing my thing and keep playing this, this story that I'm trying to develop here. Because I think we all have self-doubt on some level. What we, we do. And, and what we can do is we can begin to catch ourselves. The language that we use, especially our internal dialogue, is powerful. Like you're using the word, and, and I get it, the word problem. Anyone brings up the word problem. I just felt my shoulders go down. I felt my head go down a little bit. I felt a little bit of energy, almost like you siphoned a little bit of energy out for me. When I hear the word problem, and again, it could be a problem, right away is that I've trained myself to say opportunity. It doesn't mean that I take any less like focus away from trying to resolve this, but it's an opportunity. And if you want to go back into the past, let's go back into the past and tell me any problem that you had before. There is an opportunity to grow and learn. And still, if you did not take the lesson away at that moment, and it's still resurfacing as a problem for you. I got people like in relationships right now who are like, yeah, I got rid of that guy and everything. And I was like, so what's happening? Oh, I met this great new guy and he's nothing like that. And all of a sudden, a few weeks later, Scott, why is this person treating me the same way? I was like, because you didn't get to the root of the issue. You didn't resolve it. And so it's just in a different package right now with a different guy, but it's just a matter of time before these surfaces start to get up. So it's like, Okay, if you have a problem from the past, if something is unresolved, you can rewind that tape, go back to any issue. It doesn't change anything, but it can change the energy and how you interpret that. Folks, I've done this with people who have died in my life. I've done, I've done this with um, opportunities that I've missed out on. I've done this with my paralysis, is that it does not, it's, it's almost like a, a stage of, of forgiveness in a way. And forgiving doesn't mean forgetting. 
but it, it means that I am not going to be controlled energetically from anything from my past that is replaying itself in the present now. And so you can change that narrative. You can change the narrative starting today. So negative thought comes into mind, Brian, like, I, I can't do this, or you're no good. Just picture like your mobile device or computer, hit the delete button. You know what? You're still no good. Delete and keep on deleting and then get this thing involved. Hey, you know what, Hart? I have dialogues all the time. Someone saw me out in the street. I don't mumble these words up, but they're probably thinking he's got some type of mental disability too, because I'm having dialogues with myself all the time. And it's almost like, okay, Hart, what do you think the mind has to say right now? And the heart's just like, stop, stop. It knows the drama that's going on. It just wants to simplify and clarify. It just wants to be in the moment and have an experience. Does it mean we're going to succeed all the time? No. Does it mean we're going to fail sometimes? Yeah, but we're going to learn from these experiences and we're going to emerge stronger. That's what the heart's trying to tell us right now. And this is where, and I, I don't want to get into all of this, but what's been going on the past few weeks and with racism and everything is that let's get in our hearts. Folks, we, we came into this world with one title and that was human being. And again, we need to see, we need to learn more. I, I don't even know how to put it into words necessarily because I'm doing a deeper dive within. Because I, 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 I don't want to get into all of that, but there is something to be learned for me, with as much as I talk, with as much as I feel that I'm accepted, no, I want to learn more. The moment where in any area of my life, I don't have anything to learn anymore, you know what you do? You dig a hole in the ground, you put me in it, you cover me with dirt. Let's just like kill me right now. So it's about appreciating where you are, appreciating how much work I've put into this and how much I'm diving into this, but knowing full well is that there's another level. And you could almost say like, oh, I got to do more work. And I, I thought I did this and it's an onion. There's another level. You can take that approach or you can say, what's next? What's next that's going to help me help myself so that I can help more people? That's why I do work on myself. Not to say, oh, wow, it's all about me. No, that's selfishness. I do work on myself so that I can get to know other people even more and connect with them on deeper levels. Everything's pointing this way, buddy. Everything's pointing this way. That's awesome. I could back up your your teachings by just saying, you know, I, I went to a, a public uh, a, an event many years ago. It was probably, well, from 50 now. So it's probably 35. So it's only 15 years ago. Not that long, 15 years. And it was an Anthony Robbins event. We're both tremendous fans, right? Group, great big, actually you've met Anthony Robbins, right? He held my legs when That's we right. did power walk on my hands. Yeah. He, I felt like the first time I met him, he was going to swallow me. The man is huge. <laughs> he's huge. His he's hand huge. is like... I thought he was going to come up like a, <laughs> like a dinosaur and swallow me. Yeah. So you go you go there to get pumped up, you know, to be inspired and such. And 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 this wasn't just an Anthony Robbins event, but he had a whole lineup of speakers. And this one gentleman gets on the stage, a very respected person. I'm not going to use his name because he's somebody who's at the forefront of today's news. He, he was in the lineup with Anthony Robbins and he's standing up there and he literally says, look, if you're over the age of 30, you know, and I was like 35 or so, and you haven't made it, you're probably, you're, you're just not going to make it. And once you hit 40, if you haven't made it, you, your, your chances are pretty much zero. You're not going to, and because of the weight that this person carried, he had wrote, written several books. He was a prominent business person and such. You know, that's stuck in my mind. It was like crushing. I I, I, I literally think that uh, Anthony Robbins was behind stage play with the hook, you know, like da -da -da -da, getting this guy off. Like, this isn't what we what we wanted it to be. But that stuck with me for a long period of time until I started because I was replaying it. I was replaying somebody else's message. And I think what you were saying before was like, we can change no matter what age. And I started the Max Challenge. I completely shifted my business focus, completely changed you know, my uh, internal dialogue and my mental point, my point of view, when I was like in my early 40s. And that was the, the Max Challenge was only founded eight, nine years ago. So, you know, anyone on here who's who's watching, who's looking and saying, yeah, but I'm 50. Yeah, but I'm 55. Yeah, but I'm, I mean, I'm up here. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I'm still like, and I still have self-doubt. I'm still saying, wow, like I'm investing all this time in this new project or I'm investing all this energy to take this business to the next level. And am I the person to do this? Or is there someone else that I need to? 
And then, you know, what I think I have learned is to sort of kind of like quiet that and just keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. Even if some days it's just a tiny little bit, those tiny bits add up to a whole lot. Well, Brian, we're, we're the same age and you know, uh, I, I just turned 50 in early May and everything. So my, my nephew had actually sent me a text. He said, Uncle Scott, happy birthday. You're halfway there. So <laughs> I, I got to think that there's another half of the journey, but I want to bring up an example because this is huge and folks, we can do this in any realm. We could do this politically because I know a lot of people are getting fired up politically. We could do this religiously. We can do this, this anything. Anybody says something to you directly through the news, if you choose to watch the news or whatever, and it pushes your buttons. Oh, there are button pushers out there completely because people can say things to you that can go right through. You can say, okay, I, I, I get it and everything. And then there's other things that stick. It's those things that stick because sometimes we look at button pushers as our worst enemies, but our button pushers are actually our greatest teachers because things are sticking, things are. So the way I like to look at it is that, okay, I'm working on myself and I'm trying to resolve issues. When I can't resolve specific issues, it's not like I'm doing this consciously, it's like subconsciously, I'm putting an APB out there that says, hey, I can't deal with this issue right now. So I need you to come into my life to sprinkle a little salt on this wound to the point where I experience enough pain to the point where I say enough is enough and I begin to work on it. So, and this is happening to all of us. So this is another great exercise where people can focus on it. And again, it, 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 people say like our parents are great, greatest button pushers. And I, I said, I, because they installed the buttons. So I mean, it's amazing though, to see like how many things these days, people, um, events are pushing our buttons in which, yeah, that's okay. Get frustrated, get angry, but go deep dive deep and to say, what is it about this that's unresolved? I'm not saying you have to agree with everything, but it's a matter of like, how can I find deeper acceptance of this other point of view, of this other way of thinking? Again, not necessarily have to subscribe to it, but it's no longer going to push my buttons. Because imagine if we could get to a point, Brian, where we might not agree with people, but we don't have to fire back at them. We could just say, hey, that's John being John or that's Susie being Susie and so forth. And uh, just know it's a human being born to make mistakes and hopefully learn from them. Yeah, I mean, what more could we really ask for? We're all imperfect for sure, right? No, matter what, our, no matter what our standing in society is, we're all pretty much, we, uh, what do they say? We all put our pants on the same way. See, I, I hate that line. Yeah, it takes it me is. 20 minutes to get my pants oh, on. Oh, I see. Heck with yeah. that. I, I don't want to. Scott turns me. every joke into that. Yeah. Right, I got to tell you real quick. I had, um, I want to say he was a, a third grader. This was years ago. Asked the question in one of my audience. He said, Mr. Chesney, he said, um, how do you like, how do you put your pants on? And so um, I thought it was a great question. No filtration system. Like an right. adult, like I would never ask him that. Kid, boom, in the head, out through the mouth. And I said, well, you know what? I, I, it takes me a lot of time. It's like, I, I usually can do it from my chair or I got to get on a bed and like, yeah, it's kind of like one leg at a time, but it's challenging. So he's there and he's like, not comfortable with my response or not really able to connect. And I said, I want you to do me a favor. I was like, I don't want you to do this during the week, but I want you to do it on this coming weekend. Is that I if you really want to know what I'm going through, I want you to put a pair of jeans on without moving your legs. The kid looked at me like right away, the way he looked at me, I'm like, this kid's doing it. I got a call, weekend went by, I got a call from the principal of the school asking if I would be okay talking with this kid's mother. This kid's mother, I called and she said, Mr. Chesney, I said, yes. And she said, I just wanna let you know that my son was the one who asked you about putting your pants on. And I said, okay, I started getting a little nervous. And she said, he actually put on a pair of jeans and it took him two and a half hours to oh do gosh. so. And he was so determined. He wanted to know what you went through. And I was just like, man, I love that. And you know, and I wasn't even thinking of bringing that story up, but I guess, and we can share it, is that, you know what? We, we talk about walking in someone's shoes. We talk about like, we all put pants on in the same way and everything. You know, sometimes it is a matter of going through whatever experience we can create to find out what another person is going through. And that gives us a broader perspective of life altogether. Hmm. 
That's amazing. I know you're going to try to do that this weekend, Brian, everything. So let me know how that goes. And that's sweatpants. We're talking jeans, all right? <laughs> I don't have any jeans at this point, so I can't, can't do it. <laughs> I, don't, I haven't worn jeans either. I'm afraid to put a pair of pants. It's been sweatpants for I don't know how long. <laughs> I'm actually thinking of just making this my go forward thing. T-shirt, sweatpants. Like, right. Let's do it. You know what? By you just saying that, we lost about 200 people. But that's okay. We, we're we're going we're gonna to move on. <laughs> so what closing, what, what, you want, what do you want to say to everybody closing this thing out? I... I just want to let people know that um, we're, we're resilient. We're, we're, we're still getting through this. We're still moving forward. I also, as much as I want you to dive deep and go within yourself, I also want you to be gentle with yourselves. Brian talked about four in terms of negative self-talk, in terms of demands we put on ourselves. Um, one of those things that I, I did a long time ago, and I, I think it was Debbie Ford, um, who does a lot with uh, shadow work is that she had said um, with regards to beating up on yourself mentally or being so demanding of yourself. She goes, I want you to imagine holding a little baby in your arms. And she said, how does that feel? And I remember just like, wow, this is, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. She goes, now I want you to put your face on that baby's face. And I just remember crying and just being like, because there's nothing you're going to do except love and cherish and love unconditionally that little baby. And if you're willing to give that to a child, an innocent child, how about starting to give that approach to yourself? And it's powerful. So folks, well, I, I want you to be resilient and I want you to move forward. I want you to be courageous. I also want you, everything's a balance. I also want you to be gentle with yourself and, and care for yourself. That's awesome. I'm just gonna remind everybody to visit your website, scottchesney.com and to check out your video it's, it's not a video, actually. It's a full-length documentary. It's uh, Ride the Wave, and I believe it's on Vimeo. Is that correct? Yep, on Vimeo. You can rent it. You can buy it. And, um, yeah, let me know what you think. We're all riding the wave, folks. Peaks and valleys and um, no two waves of like. And there's always another opportunity to engage another wave, whether it be out there in the ocean or another wave of, uh, of life and approaching it in a different way. Thanks again, Scott. Anytime. Thank you, Brian. Stay safe, everybody. Talk to you soon. See everybody later. Bye-bye.